Now, the rest of the story. It is 1942. 1942, Bing Crosby had just signed to do a new movie, a musical, and the composer had called a meeting on the set before filming was to start. This one composer always does this. He wants to demonstrate to director, cast, and crew how he feels that his songs should be performed. He even has a special piano, one with a special lever on it that slides the action back and forth, automatically changing keys without the player having to. It's a dilapidated little instrument, and the composer himself has a voice which carries nowhere. You almost have to hug him to hear him, but there he is, singing the score for the entire movie company. Well, Bing Crosby, the gentleman, listens patiently, but it's more than politeness. Bing can sing, but he can't read music. Did you know that? Bing Crosby could never read music. So he had to memorize everything. Well, one tune follows another, Crosby's sponge brain absorbing it all. Between songs, the composer hesitates and smiles. He says, I have an amusing little number here. And then the composer proceeds to sing it in his own high-pitched half-whisper. Some of the cast members wince. They can feel it coming. And they glance over at Bing, and sure enough, he is starting to scowl. Crosby, a staunch Catholic, is widely known as such. Anything even vaguely smacking of sacrilege does not fit well with him. The composer finishes the tune. What does everybody think, he asks. And Crosby is ice cold. An amusing little number, eh? But what's so funny? There are moments of painful silence, and then the composer continued to review his score, and afterward in private to producer Mark Sandwich, Bing Crosby announced that he would not sing that song. Sandwich knows well which song Bing means, and he apologizes if Crosby has been offended. But there's a big problem here, because a primary stipulation in the composer's contract is that nothing musical may be altered unless the composer himself does the altering. In other words, the song to which Bing objects must be sung. Well, I'm going to telescope what happened next. There was a lengthy argument, but finally Crosby reluctantly agreed to sing it. And now it's later. They're shooting the picture. It's time to do the controversial number. The composer, knowing that Bing is performing it under protest, is waiting impatiently on the set. Walter Scharf, one of the musical directors, hoping to avoid trouble, tried to trick the composer into leaving the place. The composer plays along, but then returns secretly and hides behind some scenery. If they're going to tinker with his music, he's going to find out about it. But what do you know? Bing sings it straight. And the movie is released, and more remarkable still, the amusing little tune catches on. It caught on because it's wartime, and American soldiers far from home considered it a sentimental anthem, one perfectly expressing their own longing. And when composer Irving Berlin wrote it, and subsequently when crooner Bing Crosby sang it in the movie Holiday Inn, neither man had imagined the ultimate impact that Bing's own recording would sell more than 30 million copies, that the tune itself would become second only to Silent Night, the most worldwide popular of all Christmas songs. The song the composer underestimated, the song Bing Crosby thought less than sacred enough for the Christ Mass season, the song that was almost stillborn, was White Christmas. And now you know the rest of the story. The rest of the story. Harley was a daydreamer, and much to the consternation of his wife, the condition was most apparent Sunday mornings in church. And one Sunday morning in particular, Harley appeared to doze, and the missus gently elbowed him in the ribs. Harley whispered that he was thinking about something, that he was searching his mind for the perfect name. And that is what Harley was doing. Harley's factory was just then manufacturing a new product. It had been invented right there in the plant by mistake. Somebody forgot to turn off one of the machines. And when the error was discovered, so was this remarkable, saleable result. Well, anyway, though the product's discovery was accidental, its name must be chosen deliberately because, as Harley knew very well, effective advertising and merchandising were requisite even for the finest merchandise. But a name just 
refused to come to his mind. Harley recorded pages of suggestions from business associates and friends and family. None seemed completely satisfactory. None seemed to say it all. He frowned as he read and reread the list of prospective names, and then he decided if he were ever going to choose one, he must first eliminate the obviously unpromising ones. So he did. He selected what appeared to be the best choices. He wrote them down on a clean sheet of paper. Still none was more attractive than it had been in the first place. Now two weeks have passed. Harley's fretting grew a deep concern. Prospective names distracted him during the daytime, paraded monotonously through his brain while he slept. And yet among them, the right one was utterly absent. Now we have Harley sitting in church. It's Sunday morning. He's exhausted from a fortnight of fitful sleep. He's tormented by the certainty that the absolutely right name for his product was out there somewhere hiding behind the others. So preoccupied was Harley that he remained standing after the hymn singing. The rest of the congregation had sat down. Harley is still on his feet. He's staring vacantly. He begins to draw suppressed chuckles from the brethren. His wife tugged at his coat. It was only then that Harley, embarrassed, sat down in the pew. And then the minister opened his Bible and said, quote, The text for today, this is the preacher speaking, the text for today is taken from the book of Psalms, chapter 45, verse 8. He then read it aloud. And as he did, Harley's eyes grew wide. There it was. There it was, the name for which he had so fervently searched, issuing forth down the corridors of time from the mouth of King David himself. In his elation, Harley leaped to his feet, and he ran out the door. The name for his new soap had been chosen as it would remain forevermore. Because of a factory attendance oversight, a mixing vat had been left running too long, and that's how come the soap was invented. What's happened is it got air bubbles in it, and that made it float. So the words, it floats, became its slogan. But here's how it got its name. Because Harley Proctor happened to be in church that Sunday. And he was there when the pastor read about the palaces in the book of Psalms. about the palaces of ivory. <laughs> now you know the rest of the story. And now, the rest of the story. Men like Benjamin Franklin do not visit this earth in bunches. One such man per era, and the world counts itself lucky. He is remembered as a patriot, a publisher, a philosopher, and a diplomat. His most remarkable contributions, especially considering the generation in which he lived, were of a scientific nature. Mid-18th century, when those few who knew of electricity thought it to be black magical, Ben Franklin boldly proposed to enslave it. He identified lightning as a form of electricity by flying a baited kite in a storm, and he produced his own electricity with an electrostatic generator of his own invention, through his scientific experiments, he discovered electrical polarity and the cooling effect of evaporation. And this, remember, was in the mid-1700s. Combining scientific principles with common sense, he invented the lightning rod and the Pennsylvania fireplace. And he invented bifocal glasses. And in his spare time, he charted the Gulf Stream. The world scientific community stood in awe of Ben Franklin. In 1756, he was elected to England's Royal Society. In 1772, he was elected to the French Academy of Sciences. And it might well be said that the world scientific community still stands in awe of this man. Ben Franklin was with us for 84 years. And yet it's doubtful that even at that ripe old age, he had reached his potential because so diverse so apparently boundless was his genius that one can scarcely imagine what he might have accomplished with another decade or two. You know, it's often been asked by America's scholars, where are the Ben Franklins of recent generations? A suggestion is that 
we have emphasized the concerns of the so-called common man to the point of idealizing commonness. The best of the lousiest and the lousiest of the best. And with a premium on mediocrity, one can only expect the mediocre. And thus, some say, are the would-be Ben Franklins among us encouraged to think small. But that might not be all. For in the 200 years since Franklin's death, the world has made astonishing strides in almost every area, except perhaps in reliably measuring a child's potential. Who in the entire 18th century had more potential than Benjamin Franklin? Nobody. And yet, nobody would have recognized it when he was a little boy. You see, little Ben, this youngster who would grow up to chart the Gulf Stream and to discover electrical polarity and the cooling effects of evaporation, this scientific genius who invented the lightning rod and the Pennsylvania fireplace and bifocal glasses, that same child who, in addition to future careers in journalism and diplomacy, was destined to distinguish himself as an inventor and as a scientist, he, young Ben, the embodiment of all this human potential at the age of 10, was forced to quit school and go to work because he failed in arithmetic. Ben Franklin, remember, a penny saved is a penny earned? When he was little Ben, he flunked math. And he flunked it twice. And now you know the rest of the story. Now, the rest of the story. His name was Wade Morrison. 100 years ago, early in the 1880s, he was a young pharmacist working at a drugstore in rural Retreat, Virginia. The drugstore was owned by a local physician, a rather stern old fellow, but a fair employer. And Wade was in love with his employer's daughter. Irredeemably infatuated, young Wade Morrison arrived early at church every Sunday just so he could be standing at the door as she walked inside. Passing her house, Wade always strolled slowly, hoping for a glimpse of his beloved or perhaps even a wave should she be sitting on the front porch. Wade Morrison racked his lovesick brain for a way to get and hold the attention of his employer's lovely young daughter. And when next she did come into the drugstore, it all happened quite naturally. He said, good afternoon and she answered with the same words and she was smiling and he stepped behind the soda fountain proudly announced that he'd been experimenting and he had invented a special soda just for her artfully combining a variety of fruit flavors he prepared the delightful concoction she blushing said that she was flattered and so wade's one-way romance blossomed into a mutual one he asked if he might call on her. Happily, she granted his request, and within weeks, their relationship intensified. He was about to propose when the whole world caved in on top of Wade Morrison. The girl's father, Wade's employer, came into the drugstore one morning, said he wanted to have a word with a young pharmacist. He said, I'll get right to the point. He said, I don't want you seeing my daughter anymore. And then the stern old physician explained his reasoning, the predictable protest that his little girl was too young to make up her own mind. And then a rather, rather cruel postscript to the effect that when his daughter was old enough, surely she would have the good sense to entertain a more worthy suitor, a lawyer perhaps, or should she be so lucky, a respected physician like her father. The next day, the unhappy young pharmacist was packed and gone from rural retreat, gone west, never ever to return. Runaway Wade Morrison's broken heart did mend. He settled in Waco, Texas, eventually owned his own drugstore there. Respected in his community, happily he married a Texas girl. His life in the west proved even more rewarding than it could ever have been elsewhere. And strangely, he owed it all to that stern old Virginia physician who had refused to have him for a son-in-law. It was appropriate then, was it not, that the most popular soda invented and served in Wade Morrison's own drugstore 
the soda that he had first concocted for his long-lost love was named after his boyhood employer. And as surely as he never forgot that first painful, wonderful love of his young life, he was never going to let you forget her father, the man whose callous disapproval ultimately drove a young pharmacist to a success that otherwise he could never have known. It was not just a made-up name. There really was a stubborn old Virginia physician named Dr. Pepper. Only now you know the rest of the story. The rest of the story. Al was useless, utterly useless. He told his sister in a letter, quote, I am nothing but a burden to my family. Really, it would have been better if I had never been born. He had been taken out of school as a youngster because he was what we would now consider retarded. Remember what I just said. He had been taken out of school because he was considered what we would now call retarded and had to be tutored at home by his mother. By the age of 22, Al had hit bottom. His parents, impoverished, were no longer able to support him. He needed a job, but nobody would hire him. And so in desperation, Al appealed to an old school friend, a fellow whose class notes he used to copy. The friend's father had government connections. And a few days later, Al was being interviewed for a position at the Federal Patent Office. Fred Haller was then director of the agency. He would conduct the interview personally. Haller informed the young man that he needed personnel capable of judging whether a request for a patent had any justification. What do you know about patents, the director asked. Now said nothing. Didn't know a thing about patents. The director arched an eyebrow. Under ordinary circumstances, he would have terminated the interview right then and there. And yet there was something, I guess, there must have been something intriguing in the young man's frankness. The director said, tell me a little bit about yourself, and Al forced a smile. What was there to tell? He'd been thrown out of high school at the age of 15, and with no high school diploma, college had been out of the question. So he applied at a technical school, but he flunked the entrance exam. So he went back to high school, a different one, actually, because his old high school refused to readmit him. This time, he did manage to graduate, he was even accepted at technical school, and yet when potential employers subsequently discovered that he had cut classes chronically, that he had passed his exams only very narrowly, that he had treated his professors irreverently, nobody would hire him. So Al had, had the word loser written all over him. Now here he was in the Federal Patent Office asking for a job for which he was not qualified. But Director Haller was a very patient man, I guess. He'd heard all of the reasons why he should not hire Al. Now he wanted to hear some reasons why he should. And remarkably, that interview continued for most of two hours. And by the time it was over, the director had come to this conclusion. Al was not stupid. He had not been retarded. He was simply a failure. And if he were ever to stop failing and make something of himself, it would first require a large dose of self-confidence. From somewhere, he was going to have to get some self-confidence. So Director Haller decided to give Al a break, a probationary job as technical expert third class. Posterity's impressions of Al is larger than life. He was not inexorably destined to guide lesser minds through space and time. In fact, at the age of 22, he stood at the brink of utter uselessness. Until at long last, somebody took a chance on him and gave him a job at the Swiss Federal Patent Office. And inspired by his first unequivocal success, he eventually learned to live up to his best. And from that beginning, became the incomparable genius the world knows as Albert Einstein. And now you know the rest of the story. The rest of the story. War song. Those two words themselves are in conflict with each other, and yet for the sake of world culture, this is a music of penultimate importance. Remember, our own national anthem is a war song of sorts.
Anthropologists theorized that this was among the first music to be sung, that primitive people probably conjured their cult rituals around the war song, used it to accompany fiery dancing. In ancient Greece, songs were sung by Spartan warriors at their campfires. Other songs were sung to harden the spirits of those about to enter battle. The words to many anthems of war are based on sound psychological principles. What could be more encouraging than the brave deeds of forefathers or a victory projected, predicted in music? By the end of the 15th century, army units began to have trumpeters and drummers and pipers. Their music supported the discipline of marching, the urge to battle. So it was in the American Revolution. You know the songs we sang. But now you're going to hear about an enemy anthem, a rhyme for the Redcoats. Some say the British tune in 2-4 can be traced to a song of French vineyard workers, and others argue it came from a Spanish sword dance or a German harvest tune or a Dutch peasant song. We're just not sure, but we do know this. British soldiers sang it during the French and Indian War a full two decades before the signing of the Declaration of Independence, and they would use it to shudder the courage of the colonists throughout the revolution, sometimes posting troops to sing it outside a church during colonial religious services. It was meant to taunt us. It was meant to make us afraid. But then a curious thing happened to this demoralizing melody. We stole it. We just lifted it from the redcoats, words and all. We lifted it from the voices of our enemies. One patriot suggested that we should change the words befitting the colonial cause. And though he, a man named Francis Hopkinson, successfully came up with a new set of lyrics, our forefathers favored the original lyrics. Oh, Hopkinson's Battle of the Kegs was sung all right sometimes, but we, most of us, perpetuating a long tradition of musical psychological warfare knew what hurt the most, so the enemy heard their own song, their own words, thrown right back in their own ears, and you know what? It worked. It became a favorite in every camp. It was heard in battle, in defeat, and in victory. It was even played at the final surrender of General Cornwallis. Yes, the enemy anthem worked for the Americans during the Revolutionary War. And such was its subsequent popularity that it brilliantly survived the war itself. Benjamin Carr used it as an orchestral medley, the Federal Overture, written in 1794. A century later, visiting European composers would write variations on the tune, honoring the Americans and their efforts during the Revolution. And just think, this song was intended to be used only by the Redcoats to needle American troops during our revolution until with incomparable American mischief, we turned the needle around and it was they, the British, who got the point for the Redcoat rhyme that we made our own forevermore was Yankee Doodle. And now you know the rest of the story. Now, the rest of the story. Forty years ago, Reed Stout was principal and athletic coach and sometimes a school bus driver for the Bedford Agricultural School in Lambertville, Michigan. The 150 student school encompassed kindergarten through 12th grade. Everything the youngsters knew about football and baseball and basketball and track they learned from Reed Stout. Now, one crisp autumn day, October 1948, Reed was driving the Bedford School bus. He had just dropped off some students after school at the corner of Douglas and Dean Streets. He was about to pull away from the curb. Suddenly, he noticed some boys and girls on the sidewalk craning their necks, apparently looking at something directly in front of the bus. Reed glanced forward out the windshield. He saw nothing. He was about to drive off when he had an inexplicable sensation, a feeling that he must go no farther. So Reed reset the handbrake. He asked one of the students on the bus to get off and investigate. The child did and called back that there was a little girl in front of the bus, a little girl crouching in the path of the right front wheel. Well, Reed was astonished. He looked out the windshield again, moving his forehead right up against the windshield this time. Still, he saw nothing. Reed turned off the engine, he got out of the bus himself, he looked down at the right front wheel in stunned horror. 
because there, stooping together her fallen school books and scattering papers, oblivious to what had almost happened, fortunately unharmed, was a blonde, blue-eyed Susie Hetzel, age nine. Still unaware of any danger, Susie looked up and said, Oh, hello, Mr. Stout. Overcome with emotion and relief, where no one could see deep down inside, Reed Stout, then and there, cried. And then he admonished little Susie and sent her on her way. And she was all the way across the street before Reed turned on the ignition and left the curb. Now that evening, still visibly shaken, the principal coach bus driver went home and told his wife, I almost ran over a child today. At supper he could not eat. In bed he could not sleep. The rest of the week he could not concentrate. To anyone who would listen, he would retell the story of the tragedy he had almost caused, of the anguish which even now he suffered, and of how his conscience would give him no peace until he had solved the dilemma of the school bus driver's blind spot. One year of pondering and experimenting led nowhere until he was visiting a neighbor's backyard and saw a decorative shiny reflective sphere on top of a piece of pottery which the neighbor had given him and which Reed then cut in half and mounted on the hood of the Bedford school bus. For as long as you can remember you have seen those convex mirrors on school buses. Those bellied out reflectors, those convex reflectors that give the driver a wide-angle view. Well, you have just met the school bus driver inventor who started it all. His name was Reed Stout. He made no headlines. He erased them. And now you know the rest of the story. The rest of the story. The Constitution of the United States of America did not just happen. Well, this is the rest of the story. As the guns of the revolution fell silent and the smoke cleared, what remained was a lukewarm alliance of 13 states, inadequately governed by a document called the Articles of Confederation. So divergent were the interests of the states, so unstable was our western frontier that many doubted our ability to keep on keeping on. We had beaten the British, but could we survive ourselves? In 1786, state representatives met in Annapolis, Maryland to discuss the difficulties of interstate commerce. Nothing much was agreed upon except that another meeting would be necessary, and so in the autumn of that year, the states were invited to send delegates to Philadelphia to take into consideration the situation of the United States. It was this congregation which Thomas Jefferson, then United States Minister to France, which he would refer to as an assembly of demigods, compliment intended, the history books would call it simply the United States Constitutional Convention, for it was there and then that our Constitution was born. Or was it really? For although James Madison is widely recognized as the father of the Constitution, and he was, in fact, its principal architect. It must be remembered that he was a student of world governments, and he was admittedly influenced by other systems of social order. He was a copycat. You see, until we came along, there was once upon a time a one-of-a-kind republic on this planet, a confederacy of democratic sovereign states which voluntarily had delegated certain broad prerogatives of sovereignty to a federal government. And those prerogatives were defined and limited by a constitution. And Ben Franklin studied it and thought that was a good idea. He was particularly impressed by their document. He admired those who had created it. He once wrote in effect that if they could do so, so could we. Franklin had been studying their form of government for decades. They had a three-chambered parliament, which now bears striking resemblance to our Senate and House and Supreme Court. Among the modern concepts of democratic rule established by this other republic, 
the one that we ultimately were to copy, were wide representative elections, senatorial plurality, absence of hereditary sovereigns, and of course the basic freedoms, notably unilateral freedom of religion. Thomas Jefferson was another admirer of that system, of that equitable, ingenious constitution. Many scholars have suggested that this other republic was the intellectual progenitor of the United States of America. Well, it certainly is obvious that our Constitution is patterned after theirs, however inadvertently, for they had demonstrated in advance that this kind of freedom with responsibility was the best way to ensure orderly rule. And the remarkably similar republic to which I refer predated ours by 300 years. It was the League of Iroquois Nations. That's right. It was the Indians who taught us about freedom. Now you know the rest of the story. Now, the rest of the story. It is half a century and a fragrant memory away in the Blue Ridge foothills of North Carolina on a dusty country road 30 miles northwest of Pilot Mountain. Stay on that road. It is taking you home to a place that shines in your heart like a lighted window on a dark night, to a little town that rises from the mountain mist like a backwoods brigadoon, to a gentle community called Mount Airy. There, everybody knows everybody, and everybody is worth knowing. Mr. Forrest, the town barber, whose shop was in the square next to the shoe store. Pretty Miss Valentine, the fourth grade teacher, secret sweetheart of every small boy who ever daydreamed in her class. Gruff old Wade Stillman, the proprietor of the local pool hall, keeper in line of the town's mischievous teenagers. There's Floyd Pike, the kindly electrician, and Bess Merritt, the stern-faced lady principal of Rockford School, and Sam Patterson, the smiling, handshaking town sheriff. Their homes are all there, on streets lined with silver maple and sycamore, in a place of happily ever aftering called Mount Airy. This is as it was 50 years ago, when a boy was growing up there, a boy who lived on Haymore Street in a white frame house with a swing on the front porch, he loved to fish in Lovell's Creek for horny heads and perch, down where the afternoon breezes whispered in the birch trees, down by the big slick rock that jutted five yards out into the stream. He loved to swing on the rope that hung from a neighbor's tree or sit on the curb at night with the other boys, playing the harmonica and telling ghost stories. His dad was shipping foreman at the local furniture company. The boy worked there during summer months. And then came the autumn and the sycamores would turn brown and the silver maples would explode in crimson and yellow flame and it was back to the red brick schoolhouse on Rockford Street. After school, there was Lamb's Drug Store for a soda and a free stand on the scale with a big glass dial and there were Saturday matinees at the Grand and Sunday services at Haymore Street Baptist and picnics in the Glen and hot dogs at the Snappy Lunch Cafe and a constant companion mongrel pooch named Tippy, who rode everywhere in a handlebar basket on the boy's bicycle. And one day that same boy left his happy haven in the Blue Ridge foothills, first for the university at Chapel Hill, and then forever. But he took with him an overstuffed scrapbook of Mount Airy memories, a collection of unfading photographs of all his mind, landscapes of enchanted places, portraits of a warm family and true friends and good neighbors. And from those recollections always arose the aroma of love, the tie that bound, the true magic of that otherwise insignificant town. And those gentle ghosts continued to haunt the boy wherever he went until he brought them to life for the rest of us to share. You may have wondered where that wonderful place came from. Well, it was real. And for one brief shining moment, it belonged to a boy who grew up and had a television show and took us 
smiling by the hand to once upon a time. The boy was Andy Griffith, and his beloved country Camelot Mount Airy became Mayberry, USA. And now you know the rest of the story. Now, the rest of the story. L.Z. Seagar was in some ways the least likely creator of a cartoon superhero. But here he was, about to put the finishing touch on his creation, the catalyst that transformed his hero into a human dynamo. And the idea for that transforming factor had come from a real-life scientific study. Almost 60 years previous, a German researcher named von Wolf had measured certain nutrients in food, had discovered a particularly high nutrient content in one vegetable, ten times the iron in that vegetable than in others. And so, eating it would transform L.G. Seagar's comic strip hero into a superhero. Have you guessed? <laughs> and probably you're right. He was strong to the finish because he ate his spinach. He was Popeye the Sailor Man. You remember how he did it? He'd be losing in some desperate battle with a bully or a villain tied up or getting pummeled or something. But he'd manage just barely to get hold of a can of spinach. And then he'd squeeze that can until the spinach popped out and upward in a cartoon arc and straight into his mouth, promptly following his forearms would bulge and his anchor tattoo would swell to many times its size. And thus did Popeye the Sailor Man become the original Iron Man. Popeye made the first newspaper appearance in January 1929, and by the mid-1930s, spinach consumption had increased in the United States 33%. It had all started, of course, in 1870 with Dr. Von Wolf and his scientific analysis, which revealed an iron content in spinach equal to that in red meat. Oh, and remember I said Popeye's creator, L.Z. Seagar, was an unlikely superhero innovator? Well, you know, he was a house painter, not a cartoonist in the beginning. And the cartoons he wound up drawing, including Popeye, were simply based on neighbors he had grown up living alongside in Chester, Illinois. But what a hilariously enduring world he constructed from paper and ink, ruled by a cantankerous old seafarer whose supercharged tonic was spinach. And here's the thing. That scientific assessment of the nutrient value of spinach was conducted in 1870. Remember Dr. Von Wolf? But in 1937, eight years after Popeye's debut in The Funnies, a team of German chemists reassessed Dr. Von Wolf's assessment, and uh-oh, a suspicious decimal point, which Dr. Von Wolf had misplaced somehow. And now, oh my, the iron content in spinach turns out to have been ten times less than the original study had suggested. And so it was clear that there was no more iron in spinach than in any other vegetable, even lettuce. But the correction of that original significant mistake was completely ignored amid other concerns of the times. Of course, now I'm telling you, but don't tell Popeye, that the super strength he thought came from that leafy green rocket fuel was all in his mind, and yours, and mine. Only now we know the rest of the story. Author Philip Van Doren Stern got the idea one winter morning in 1938 while he was shaving. He was shaving, and the entire story came to him, beginning to end, right there in front of the bathroom mirror. But Philip would not write the story down until a year later, and he would not try to sell the story until four more years had passed, and even then nobody would buy it. He tried to interest magazines in publishing it, he was turned down by everything from the Saturday Evening Post to the local farm journals. Finally, a movie studio bought the story, which the author had entitled The Greatest Gift. RKO Radio Pictures purchased the property at the suggestion of Cary Grant, by the way. Cary Grant thought the hero might be a suitable role for himself someday. 
And yet, try as they might, RKO screenwriters simply could not adapt the story to a movie-worthy script. So more years passed. RKO sold The Greatest Gift to another movie maker who had just organized a new company called Liberty Films. That producer-director's name, by the way, was Frank Capra. And under his loving guidance, Philip Stern's little Christmas story did grow into one of the most moving and heartwarming tales ever told. And each Christmas time, televiewers thrilled to the retelling of an all-American yarn which Frank Capra retitled, It's a Wonderful Life. But this is the rest of the story. The motion picture, It's a Wonderful Life, is about a man named George Bailey on the brink of suicide, granted a unique opportunity to see what the world would have been like had he never been born. It's a Wonderful Life has become a classic, consistently listed by critics among the ten greatest movies ever made, but it did not become an American cultural phenomenon until the mid-1970s, and there's a reason for that, aside from its intrinsic greatness. For you see, when It's a Wonderful Life first appeared in theaters, December 1946, it received mixed reviews. It barely broke even at the box office received not one Academy Award. Its less than spectacular reception was a tremendous disappointment to Frank Capra. It was so generally ignored over the following three decades that in 1974, when its copyright came up for renewal, somebody in the studio office forgot or didn't bother to go to the trouble of renewing the copyright. And that's how one of the 10 greatest motion pictures of all times slipped inobtrusively into what's called the public domain. And that's why America's undisputed favorite holiday movie became just that, because television stations can air it for free. And so they air it often, exposing it to millions. Experts guesstimate that the owners, had they held on to the copyright, It's a Wonderful Life would be earning them conservatively $26 million a year. In addition to the more than 1,200 radio and television stations airing it at least twice each year, there are 15 video companies selling the classic on cassette. They're cranking out copies for what amounts to the wholesale cost of blank tape. That's right. To paraphrase its original title, maybe that is the greatest gift of all. That we all get rich every Christmas time. In lots of ways. Because we get to see and re-see and re-see It's a Wonderful Life. Just because somebody, maybe some bumbling guardian angel, failed to renew the copyright. By the way, had that whoever it was back there bothered to renew the copyright, it would have cost his employers a renewal fee of only f of only four dollars. Merry Christmas. And now you know the rest of the story. Now, the rest of the story. And to this one, let's both pay attention. Gasoline on the way to $5 a gallon. You've heard the headlines. But if you believe in facing our fears, you have a splendid opportunity to do so right here and now. I have a collection of articles from national news magazines published between January 20 and May 12. Now, these are articles focusing on the gasoline crisis, its causes, its ramifications, and maybe its remedies. Now try to follow me here. The January 20 headline reads, The World Race for Oil. And it says, and I'm quoting, What gold was in earlier ages, oil is in these days. Oil is the paramount factor in the political economies of the day. Besides the material ingredients of petroleum, there are involved in it the moral elements of peace or war and friendship or antagonism between races and nations and creeds. Oil may soothe the troubled waters of the eternal seas, says one writer, but it only adds unrest to the troubled waters of international diplomacy." End quote. And here is a parallel estimate of the situation from the Washington Post, quote, Oil has become the great international issue of the hour. It lurks in the background of virtually every problem now engaging the attention of world statesmen. Politics has become the politics of petroleum. Almost no move is made on that chessboard that is not tinctured with oil, including the pending situation in the Near East, all the way from the Persian Gulf to the Golden Horn. All right. Two months later, March 17, dismal headlines. Envisioning the price per gallon that Americans may ultimately pay, one related news story focused on a Senate subcommittee investigation into the higher and higher cost of petroleum products 
The subcommittee report includes several recommendations, but now the most recent headline is dated May 12 and says how much gasoline are you wasting? The article states that one billion gallons of gasoline will be wasted during the current year. Blames motorists mostly for driving too much. Includes a plea for self-discipline to avert what threatens to become an emergency situation. But I'm telling you pretty much what you already know, am I not? I mean, you know that we need to conserve. You know that gas prices are intolerably high. You know that oil and international unrest are practically synonymous. Of course, had we only foreseen this crisis, we might by now be so much further down the figurative road on the way to energy independence through alternative fuels. But foreseen is the word here. You see the headlines, World Race for Oil, and How Much Gasoline Are You Wasting? These headlines appeared in the Literary Digest and in the Washington Post, January through May, 1923. 1923. The unmistakable warnings of our personal waste and our foreign dependence and our international diplomatic peril. All of those warnings in headlines were written and read 85 years ago, including one nightmare prediction, quote, a vision of one dollar a gallon gasoline. That's a quote. A vision of one dollar a gallon gasoline. Well, now you know the rest of the story. The rest of the story. It's difficult to believe that she has been in the public eye for more than three decades. But then she looks much younger than she is. Many cosmetic surgeries, they say. And yet we shall not seek to destroy the illusion, if indeed it is one, we shall accept at face value that which is among the world's most valuable faces. There has been much speculation regarding the secret of her continued success. Offhand, I would guess that it's her remarkable ability to reflect each generation as though she belonged to it. When she began as a fashion model, 1959, her makeup was heavy, her expression perpetually severe. That was in, then, during the 60s, America became increasingly culturally experimental and somehow she reflected our national willingness to change and her public image evolved. Now became a heightened emphasis on sexuality. You were beginning to see her on television about that time and beyond her classic visage, her flawless figure, something even more special was emerging. She was becoming a cultural heroine. Not only an American dream girl, but really a symbol of the American dream, coinciding with the domination of the nation's youth and such sentiments as trust nobody over 30, she actually appeared younger than she had years earlier, not only as she dressed, but in that marvelous face. And when we as a people became hurt and disillusioned, she was looking forward to happier times, the 70s, when her image would blossom into that of a bold, glamorous, strutting superstar. As most successful models, she has been photographed in every imaginable recreation, fishing, skating, and skiing, swimming, cycling, and jogging, even roller disco dancing. You've seen her sailing and surfing, clam digging, horseback riding, dancing ballet, and playing croquet. She's been characterized in myriad professions, nurse, secretary, fashion designer, Olympic athlete. She's even posed as an astronaut. And yet what has elevated her beyond mere celebrity status is measured in more than the millions she has made for her promoters. So genuinely, culturally phenomenal is she that a year-long study was financed by Yale University, an academic investigation of her enduring popularity through rapidly changing times and of the many conclusions drawn by that study was this one. Never once in her career, never once in the 30 years, did she attempt to anticipate a trend. She waited patiently for each cultural standard to develop before reflecting it in her public appearance. She was a follower, not a leader. Today she has several sports cars and a yacht and a private plane and 11 homes. She has reportedly undergone no fewer than four facelifts and has perhaps tried on more clothing than any fashion model in all history. 
And even though the majority of her admirers are children, each generation matures with a special place in its heart, not for a living person, but for a versatile dress-me-up toy. The face that launched a thousand of fantasies. After 31 years, we still call her the Barbie doll. And now you know the rest of the story. Now, the rest of the story. Americans in the early 1800s were just mad about almanacs. Some favorites were the Country Almanac, the Longworth Pocket Almanac, the New England Almanac, the U.S. Calendar, the Counting House Almanac. Almanacs often bore the names of their publishers, the Smith and Foreman's Almanac, McCullough's Almanac, and Stevens, and Robinson's, and Levitt's, and Munsell's, and Webster's, and Banneker's Almanacs. Some 1,500 different almanacs published simultaneously just in the Northeastern United States alone. Our forefathers loved almanacs. But this is the rest of the story. Robert B. Thomas was 10 years old when the Declaration of Independence was signed, and as a young man, he was a schoolmaster. At 26, he decided to publish an almanac. And 23 years later, that same almanac was being published by that same Bob Thomas. Now we come to the summer of 1815. In November, as always, the almanac for the following year would be distributed the text of which had just gone to the printer. Bob was very happy to see it done this year because all the while he was racing against the deadline, he'd been coming down with a flu. He kept telling himself he can't afford to be sick. So he drove himself and he managed to stay fork and end down until the last word on the last page had been written until the completed volume had been sent to the print shop. Now you know the letdown, the physical and mental unwinding that often follows a major accomplishment. Well. That's what Bob's threatening flu bugs had been waiting for. Bob became magnificently ill. He went to bed and stayed there. With one considerable consolation, his almanac had gone to press. Now, the next day the printer visited Bob's home. Said he hoped Bob was feeling better. Bob said he was not, but thanks anyway. The printer said he hated to bring this up, Bob being so miserable and all, but there was a problem with the almanac. In next year's weather predictions, the month of July was missing. Well, Bob heaved an exasperated sigh. He instructed the printer to fill in the space. The printer said, with what? The ailing publisher said, fill it in with anything. And the printer nodded and left. I do not believe Bob Thomas had figured on his printer's sense of humor. You see, the weather the printer spontaneously predicted in the blank space under the heading of July 1816 was snow. Snow in July. And a lot of copies of that almanac were run off. Before Bob got well and discovered what had happened, annoyed, he demanded the ludicrous forecast of snow in July be replaced with something plausible, so it was replaced. In the rest of the editions of that particular issue, the new prediction read, a storm not far distant. And that's how many of Bob's readers read it. But you know that a good number of the 1816 almanacs with the original humorous prediction were already distributed. And an equal number of Bob's readers perusing next summer's weather were much amused by the anticipated snow in July. Now there's something I really ought to mention at this point. Of all of the hundreds upon hundreds of almanacs published back then, only one has survived. And that one was Bob's almanac. And it has been published every year since 1792. And the whole nation recognizes it even today as the Old Farmer's Almanac. That's the only one of the hundreds that survived. Folks have taken that publication quite seriously, especially since 1816. For that was the year of the tongue-in-cheek summer forecast. And that year, I mean several times over a period of several days, it really did snow in July. And now you know the rest of the story. Now, the rest of the story. Elsie Seagar was in some ways the least likely creator of a cartoon superhero. But here he was, about to put the finishing touch on his creation, the catalyst that transformed his hero into a human dynamo. And the idea for that transforming factor 
had come from a real-life scientific study. Almost 60 years previous, a German researcher named von Wolf had measured certain nutrients in food, had discovered a particularly high nutrient content in one vegetable, ten times the iron in that vegetable than in others. And so, eating it would transform L.G. Seagull's comic strip hero into a superhero. Have you guessed? <laughs> and probably you're right. He was strong to the finish because he ate his spinach. He was Popeye the Sailor Man. You remember how he did it? He'd be losing in some desperate battle with a bully or a villain tied up or getting pummeled or something. But he'd manage just barely to get hold of a can of spinach. And then he'd squeeze that can until the spinach popped out and upward in a cartoon arc and straight into his mouth, promptly following his forearms would bulge and his anchor tattoo would swell to many times its size. And thus did Popeye the Sailor Man become the original Iron Man. Popeye made the first newspaper appearance in January 1929, and by the mid-1930s, spinach consumption had increased in the United States 33%. And it all started, of course, in 1870 with Dr. Von Wolf and his scientific analysis, which revealed an iron content in spinach equal to that in red meat. Oh, and remember I said Popeye's creator, L.G. Seeger, was an unlikely superhero innovator? Well, you know, he was a house painter, not a cartoonist in the beginning. And the cartoons he wound up drawing, including Popeye, were simply based on neighbors he had grown up living alongside in Chester, Illinois. But what a hilariously enduring world he constructed from paper and ink, ruled by a cantankerous old seafarer whose supercharged tonic was spinach. And here's the thing. That scientific assessment of the nutrient value of spinach was conducted in 1870. Remember Dr. Von Wolf? But in 1937, eight years after Popeye's debut in the Funnies, a team of German chemists reassessed Dr. Von Wolf's assessment, and uh-oh, a suspicious decimal point, which Dr. Von Wolf had misplaced somehow. And now, oh my, the iron content in spinach turns out to have been ten times less than the original study had suggested. And so it was clear that there was no more iron in spinach than in any other vegetable, even lettuce. But the correction of that original significant mistake was completely ignored amid other concerns of the times. Of course, now I'm telling you, but don't tell Popeye, that the super strength he thought came from that leafy green rocket fuel was all in his mind and yours and mine. Only now we know the rest of the story. Now, the rest of the story. He was a Sicilian immigrant, a second-rate talent with first-rate aspirations in show business. His name was Frank. She was in the chorus line at the Diamond Horseshoe. A little girl with a big heart, her name was Jacqueline. Well, Frank and Jacqueline met and married, but could afford only a cold water flat in New York's Hell's Kitchen. Their dreams had been bigger than their talents. Their baby would have to be born in a charity ward. As husband and wife stood patiently at the hospital registration desk, the nurse glanced at them casually and then back to the blank form before her. The nurse asked, name? Well, Frank gave their names, and then meekly Frank asked a question of his own. Would his wife be properly cared for? Would she and the new baby be all right on a charity ward? The nurse nodded, but as it turned out, the new baby would not be all right. It was an intern who mentioned to Frank in passing that during birth, a nerve in the child's face had been injured. There was a paralysis on the left side. His eyelids would droop. His lower lip would be affected. Inevitably, his speech would be slurred. And as the intern walked away, Frank knew he would have to work very hard to lift his family from the slums at all costs. He and his wife must flee Hell's Kitchen, must put behind them forever the charity wards. But for their baby Michael, that decision 
had come too late. Well, Jacqueline and Frank did flee Hell's Kitchen. After five years of hard work, they'd saved enough to move to a Maryland suburb of Washington to open a small business there. But as Michael, their baby boy, grew up, it was clear that the damage done to his face at birth would never be erased. And so that severed nerve would serve as a lifetime remnant of the charity ward where he was born. In school, the other children would laugh and point because Michael looked funny and he talked funny and invariably Michael would run home in tears. Why did they say those things, he pleaded with his mother. And mother would gaze down at the sagging lower lip and the drooping eyes and the youthful anguish. And she'd take Michael in her arms and once again, quietly, compassionately, she would try to explain. At the time, it seemed as though Michael's was a face... Michael's was a face that only a mother could love. But now you do. Now you love that face as well. For you see, in the apparently disorganized course of human events, it is impossible for each of us to tell the tragedy 